So let me welcome everyone to Central European University. I know we have many guests, and perhaps uh, a number of you are here for the first time. So a special welcome to all of you. I'm John Shattuck. I'm the president and rector of the university. And uh, it's our great privilege to host this rather remarkable event that uh, covers the transatlantic region in one of the most important public policy questions of our time, which is the whole issue of energy governance. So uh, I don't address you in any way as an expert, but rather as a welcoming uh, rector and president. Um, but I would, I would say that just to kind of qualify CEU before I do some further introductions as uh, an appropriate place uh, for this uh, transatlantic energy governance conference to be taking place, um, I would say the issues you're going to be addressing really are at the heart of uh, CEU's uh, public policy agenda, that is the, the, the whole transnational question of the production and uh, transmission of energy resources in this very complicated area that we're living in regarding uh, energy and sustainability. Um, and in a more academic context, I'd say what you're doing is bridging the gap that we are constantly working to bridge here at CEU between theory and practice, between the, the world, the academic world, and the world that is inhabited by people who have to live in it and work in it and make uh, progress on public policy. So I would say that energy security and governance are squarely in the middle of that uh, theory practice uh, gap, and in that sense, we're very honored to uh, to be uh, part of this this conference and to be the host. Um, clearly, the American and European uh, transatlantic aspect of this is obvious to all of you. Everything uh, that has pushed this to the top of the agenda of European countries and the United States and Canada, the volatile oil prices, the growing issues of climate uh, concern, the continuing uh, and unfolding uh, uncertainties in the Middle East and the production of energy, the increasing demand for energy in uh, China and India as well as uh, Europe and North America. Um, all of these things, the global struggle over energy resources that uh, come at the center of all of this may make this uh, a topic that I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to host you to discuss and debate here. Um, just a couple of words about CEU further as introduction to sort of qualify us as uh, an institution with strengths and advantages in this very topic. Um, we are a hybrid American-European university. We're really unique in, in our not only two legs, we actually have three legs in the sense that we are an American university fully registered in the state of New York, uh, uh, subject to the same governance rules that MIT and Harvard and others that are, uh, that are looked at by the Middle States Commission. We're also uh, certified and authenticated our degrees here in Hungary. Uh, and so we are a Hungarian university. And that gives us our third leg, which is that we are also a European university in the sense that we are uh, privileged to be able to uh, compete for and receive significant uh, research funding from the European Research Council and student financial aid funding from the Erasmus Mundus uh, programs that uh, support students coming to study in Europe from outside of Europe in the European Union. We are, we are also what I like to call a crossroads university, which is that um, you're quite close to the east and to the south when you're here in Budapest in ways that you might not be as close if you were in Paris or London or Berlin. Um, we have close <laughs> ties and connections with uh, with Turkey. We have close engagement with uh, universities in Turkey and elsewhere beyond. We, of course, have uh, tremendous uh, connections with all of the countries to the east, um, particularly in the, 
in the Eurasian landmass, and we draw many of our students from Russia and from uh, south uh, and, and from across uh, the Asian continent in that respect. So this is really a crossroads university which has students coming from over 100 countries. Uh, there is no dominant nationality here. About 50% of our students come from this region, broadly defined, including Russia and points to the east, and the other 50% from the rest of the world, including Western Europe, North America, Africa, and South America. There's only uh, one country that sort of, in a sense, stands out, but it only provides 18% of our students, and that's Hungary, where we are, and that's an appropriate uh, uh, figure for me to give you. We also are about to open a new school of public policy and international affairs uh, in September, and that will be a uh, center for uh, discussion and debate and inquiry in all aspects of uh, energy, security, and uh, certainly topics related to the sustainability of energy resources. So enough about CEU. Now you know who we are and why we're why you're coming here, you know a little bit more, and you'll learn more as the, as the uh, afternoon goes on. I want to give special thanks to the principal sponsors and organizers of this Energy Dialogue series, the Brookings Institution, uh, represented among others by Charles Ebinger, the head of the Brookings Energy Security Initiative. I, we haven't had a chance to meet, but if you're out there, welcome uh, to CEU. Um, the Global Public Policy Institute of Berlin, uh, ably represented by Wolfgang Reinecke, who's up here to my left. Um, and uh, and I also want to thank our partner in Budapest, the Norwegian Embassy, and my friend, Ambassador Siri Sletner, thank you so much for helping us uh, mount this, this uh, fascinating conference. I want to thank the donors who made this conference possible, the European Commission, represented by Dr. Tomasz Szuc, who is the head of the European Union representation in Hungary. Thank you, and welcome to you. Um, the Dreger Foundation, represented by its director, Dr. Petra Pesula. Uh, I also want to welcome, uh, you may not be here yet, uh, uh, Michael Sullivan from the U.S. State Department, and uh, an old colleague of mine, Frank Kramer, is now the vice chairman of the Atlantic Council. I, I haven't seen him arrive, but we're glad to have him. Uh, my friend, Ambassador Gauri Shankar Gupta of India, welcome to you. So nice to have you always here. And finally, uh, special thanks, and now I turn the program over to our keynote speaker, uh, Nick Butler, who's the chair of the King's Policy Institute and former Group Vice President for Strategy and Development of British Petroleum, and he tells me that he's here. Compliments of British Airways, which got him to the ground about, I don't know, 30 minutes ago or something. Uh, I'm sure they were much delayed beyond when, he's th when he thought they were going to come. So thank you so much, and uh, I will turn the program over to you. John, uh, Wolfgang, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I th did think, uh, as the plane sat on the tarmac at Heathrow this morning, that Wolfgang was going to give this speech for me. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here. It's a great pleasure. This is a great institution. I congratulate you on everything that's been achieved here. and. Uh, Wish you good luck for all the ventures that you have on public policy, which I think are so important. Um, this conference is on shale gas, and I'm very conscious that there are people in the room who are real technical experts on shale gas, uh, who work in the business, who know the technology, and I am a very simple and humble economist who does not know that technology, so I'm here to learn as well as to talk. What I want to do is to try to set in context uh, the developments that are taking place in shale gas, to look at the positives and the negatives, to try and give you a balanced view. 
to draw out what I think are some of the implications, some of which, but not all of which, are flagged as topics for the workshops tomorrow. And I'm going to do that, uh, though I know the title talks about European energy security. I, I want to talk, because I think it's the only relevant way to look at it, about global energy security and the way that is going to be impacted, because I think in this case, Europe is a subset of a global energy market, and its security will be much determined by what happens elsewhere, as well as what, by what we do ourselves. So the first element of the context is uh, global energy demand. I think we are so accustomed in Europe to talk of crisis, uh, slowdown, one disaster after another, that we don't realize that the global economy has doubled in size since the year 2000. We also, I think, underestimate the extent to which that growth continues. We tend to think, certainly in the UK, that 2% growth a year is a great result. The global average is uh, moving back up again, and it is now perfectly predictable, uh, without going over the top, to say that the global economy will double in size again by sometime between 2025 and 2030. So 15, 20 years. That is the absolute fundamental driver of energy demand. Part of that driver is population growth. So our session this afternoon goes on for three hours. In that time, the global population will have increased by almost 30,000. Almost 250, almost a quarter of a million a day. And that is the uh, stark fact that you can't get away from. What I find remarkable is the extent to which what used to be desperately poor people have been brought into the global economy and are beginning, and only beginning in some cases, to use commercial energy supplies. Ten years ago, uh, only about two-thirds of the people in the world were in what one would call that global commercial economy. There were two billion people uh, effectively outside it. Now it's moving up to 80%. It's projected to reach 85% by 2015. Countries that we had assumed as poor, I mean, there's just been a review in the UK of people to whom we were giving development aid. And that shows those countries, including India, which is a remarkable <laughs> success story, which have moved into the, not totally, and it's not finished business, but you now have hundreds of millions of people, and um, the last time I did the calculation, I think this is still right, uh, so as well as population growth, you have these people coming into the global economy using energy. There are now something like 200 to 250 million new customers for commercial energy every year. Um, a lot of that, of course, is expressed through electricity. I just happened to see the figures for China. China is set to add by 2025 the amount of power generating capacity, that's electricity producing stations, the equivalent of the total US supply now. By 2030 or just after, China's electricity uh, production will uh, amount to the US production plus the European production. This is the whole of the global economy is moving eastward. So there is going to be no shortage of energy demand. And the question is whether shale gas can compete in that for that market. The market is there. Somebody will win it. And I think there are four main competitors of which shale gas has to, uh, has to beat, actually. Coal, nuclear, renewables, and long-distance supplies of conventional gas. 
so either pipeline or LNG. And all those four have serious problems. They all have potential, but they all have serious problems. Coal is plentiful. There is absolutely no shortage of coal in the world, but the emissions are very high, and the cost of cleanup remains extremely high. Coal, I think, will remain dominant, whether it's cleaned up or not, in some areas, including China. But it's going to be challenged, not least in Europe, if the adoption of a carbon price, which the UK has just moved to with a, setting the first baseline for a carbon price for 2013, uh, if, there, if the trend towards a carbon price takes off, coal will be seriously competitively disadvantaged as a source of electricity production. <coughs> Climate change, of course, is off the agenda, but the fact that there wasn't an effective deal in Copenhagen does not mean that the issue has gone away. I think it will come back. I think the implications of it around the world from the melting season, melting ice and seas in the Arctic to desertification and extreme weather conditions are still there. And the fact that it's off the agenda this year does not mean that it's going to stay off the agenda. So coal is one competitor for shale gas. The next is nuclear. Some people have written off the nuclear sector because of what's happened in Japan. I think it is very interesting to note that the only country which has actually closed nuclear stations as a result of what happened in Japan is Germany. I was in Germany two weeks ago and I was really quite surprised. I asked how they were replacing the, state, the production from those stations which have been taken off the grid. And they said, oh, we're importing. I asked, where are they importing from? And they are importing from France and the Czech Republic, <laughs> which have a surplus because they produce from nuclear power. No other, there are lots of reviews. Lots of countries have put nuclear on hold. Uh, but no one else has closed stations down, including the Japanese. I think the long-term nuclear problem is not the risk of uh, accidents. In fact, the station in Fukushima w was safe. It was the aftermath and the loss of power supplies from the grid because of the tsunami that caused the problems. Uh, the nuclear reactor itself was quite safe. I don't think it's going to be an issue of safety that sets the nuclear sector back. I think it's going to be the high capital cost of nuclear stations and the unresolved issue in Europe, in the US, and everywhere else of what to do with high-level waste. And I think as the Germans decommission those first stations now, that issue of waste will become a significant European public policy issue, uh, which has yet to be resolved. The third competitor for shale gas is renewables. Renewables are growing in scale, but it is worth remembering that, that is growth from a pretty low base. Renewables supply something around 2% of the world energy market now. On the International Energy Agency's most optimistic scenario of moving against climate change and carbon emissions, they will rise to just 7% by 2035. The problems um, with renewables are twofold. First of all, they're basically not economic. They need public subsidy, and they need favorable regulation to give them a protected share of the energy market. And secondly, they are mostly interruptible. They, you can't rely on consistent supplies, and therefore they have to be part of a system where something else provides the consistent baseload supply. They also rely on a very different form of electricity grid to what we've been used to. In the UK, in most of Europe, we're used to centralized supply, which is fed out down the lines to the end consumer. Renewables are distributed, they are location specific, and they need a grid which can cope with supplies that are put into that grid from all sorts of different places. 
That isn't impossible, but it's a real investment in a new capital stock, which in most countries in Europe and around the world has just not been made yet. So renewables will grow, and I don't underrate them in the, in the longer term, but none has yet broken through. So none is yet in a position where it can be purely economic without any public subsidy. The fourth competitor is long-distance supplies of conventional natural gas, which would get to the market either through pipelines or through LNG facilities. That is certainly technically doable, but the costs are quite high, as we see with all the projects coming from Central Asia and all the projects that are talked about. Uh, the gas from the Arctic, I think that would be quite expensive. The costs are high, and they are very long-term projects. An LNG facility costs six to eight billion dollars upfront capital. It takes several years to build, even be assuming you have complete political agreement to build it. And it would probably take 10 to 15 years for an investor to start seeing any return on their money. That's quite a serious length of time, and it limits the number of people who are willing to invest in it. So pipelines are easier, of course, and you can build pipelines quite quickly. <laughs> but they are vulnerable to terrorism, and they are vulnerable to interruption. I think it's noticeable that the only interruption to energy supply as a result of the Arab Spring, the only people who have lost supplies are the Israelis and the Jordanians because terrorists blew up the Egyptian pipeline across the Sinai. So pipelines are possible, but they carry risks as well. So my view overall is that for shale gas, we have a reasonably competitive environment. They can compete. And I think the pattern of development will not be uniform across the world, but my contention would be that it would be determined by the balance, country by country, of two other factors. Uh, concern with energy security and concern with the environment. Let me take the environment first. Uh, I look forward to learning at this conference from the experts I mentioned earlier just how dangerous or not dangerous shale gas and its production is. I read a lot about it in the newspapers. I see it is now an issue in the French presidential election. Uh, very heated feelings um, as a result of uh, both the media reporting and the underlying reality, which is that this is a technology with which people are not familiar. But I think as the events in France show, Shale gas is losing the environmental argument. It is seen as a, on the dirty end of energy supply. I am not saying that's true. I don't have the technical knowledge to judge that. But that is how it is seen, and I think it is going to be difficult, that much more difficult to develop shale gas in European countries where concern for the environment is high, given the failure to explain, if it's true, that shale gas is not a dirty fuel. But I don't expect those concerns to be anything like so strong in some of the other places where shale gas has been identified in very material volumes from Canada to Mexico to Argentina to China. All those places, I think, will develop those resources if they are technically available, which the latest reports say they are, and if the development can be commercial, which I would think it, it can be. The other issue is energy security. The environment is one thing, the balance is energy security, and that also varies by country. I think there is a, an issue that has not been fully articulated yet, which is that as this demand for energy, the economic growth driven push on demand, which I started with, that is fine. But if you look at oil and gas in particular, the supply to meet that 
demand is going to come from an ever more concentrating number of sources, a limited number. If you look at oil, uh, we are used to thinking of OPEC, the oil exporters, as a fixed group. That is no longer the case, and I think within five to ten years, at least five of the countries in OPEC will stop having the ability to export oil. And the potential to export, and certainly the potential to increase current export, export levels, is concentrated on a very few number of countries around the world. One or two in West Africa, Russia, and five countries around the Persian Gulf. The United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Iraq. And it's worth, if you look at the International Energy Agency numbers, uh, out to 2025, 20, 2030, they assume a steadily rising and reliable production of four to five million barrels a day each from Iran and Iraq to balance the world market. That is a, a tough ask and a strong degree of concentration that I think will raise the concern about energy security. I think the uh, gas, there are also concerns when it comes to gas. The gas market is more diverse as LNG is developed, but the pipelines, the pipeline system, once you have it in place, does create a degree of dependence between one supplier and one user. And that is the problem across a lot of Eastern Europe with the reliance on Russian gas. And I think it is, uh, again, something that is going to raise the concern about energy security as we go forward. So shale gas, in my view, is much more likely to be developed in areas where energy security is important. And I would define three. One, the United States, which whenever I go, and there are people here who know it much more directly than I do, I find a weariness with engagement in the Middle East, a absolute determination not to get involved in any future wars, not least because the ones they're involved in already are too complicated and there's no clear point of success. Uh, so a desire to move the whole pattern of the energy mix in the US away from dependence on oil and dependence on imported oil in particular. And you see that reflected in the spending on research, on science, you see it in the development of indigenous supplies within the US, including shale gas. The second is those areas around the world where there is nervousness for one reason or another about the behavior of Russia. And that stretches from Eastern Europe to China, which I think has resisted for a long time the idea of importing gas from Russia and therefore being dependent upon it. I think that that will continue, and Russia, though it is a different place to what it was 25 years ago, is still not seen, uh, unfortunately, as a totally reliable uh, trading partner governed by the rule of law. And the third area, uh, it, which is countries which are traditionally independent and self-reliant, and by that I mean particularly China, which I think must look ahead now and see to meet all those demand projections, the number of people they've brought into the real economy. Uh, they need more and more imports of both oil and gas, and that makes them more and more dependent on areas of the world which they have sought to get involved with but have not totally succeeded in the Middle East and in Africa. And I think that anything that enables China to be more self-reliant in energy will be seized upon. And that is why they're working on nuclear, they're working on some aspects of the renewable business, including wind, and I think that they will pick up the opportunity of shale gas. So my conclusion is that the prospects for shale gas are really very strong. The full potential is not known. The Detailed reports that have been published recently in the US leave other areas, including India, 
very interestingly uncovered, and I think that that is an area of real, according to the geologists, of real potential, and the Middle East. So we don't yet know the full scale of this new resource space, the Energy Information Administration put out its report two or three weeks ago saying, putting very large numbers, but that was only for the 32 countries that they had done research on, and that didn't include India, the Middle East, or Russia itself. So I think the potential is there. I think it will reshape the trading pattern of the energy market. I think it will put a big question over some of the long-distance gas projects. <laughs> I think it will push down general gas prices because there is already something of a surplus and this adds to the surplus. Uh, and I think it will extend perhaps by 10 or 20 years. This is a contentious view, but I believe it's right. It will extend by 10 or 20 years the hydrocarbon economy before we move to anything else. Not everybody will welcome all that. And in some areas, and it may be France is the, is the prime example in this case, just as Germany is in the nuclear case, development will be impossible. This will not be a uniform story. Where the balance of public opinion and attitudes is in favor of the environment, shale gas is unlikely to be developed unless its reputation is changed. I think for Europe, and for each individual part of Europe, the really interesting question is that balance between a very intriguing balance of judgment between your concern about the environment and your concern about energy security. And it will be fascinating to watch how each European country, because I think there's a lot of shale gas potential, um, some of which not yet found, but uh, uh, so I'm told by the geologists. I think it's that balance which will be the most interesting public policy debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I don't want to make too much advertisement for British Airways, but I'm certainly glad and happy that they did touch down on time because uh, even if you had given me a manuscript, I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of presenting it in the, in the eloquent uh, and informative way uh, as you did. And um, when we talked before, you said you wanted to provide us, um, if you will, the context uh, for this conference, and I really appreciate uh, that you did this, and you did it, I guess, from, from two angles. On the one hand, you, you embedded the debate over Shell, shale gas in the context of the other energy sources, which I think is important and I think which this conference, as much as it may drill down into the specifics of shale gas, has to of course keep in the back of their mind because uh, we can look at this, if you will, in, in a, from an absolute perspective, but I think the relative perspective and the relative dimension, because all of these technologies and, and techniques have, have pros and cons, is critical in, in debating the future of this potential energy source. And then you provided us with, with the different perspectives, uh, certainly given your background and your experience, both from a private sector perspective, but also the public dimension to this problem, whether it's governance questions, public policy questions, or of course, if you will, the, the, the broader public dimension of the environmental issue. So, so I want to thank you for, for your, your presentation. You also said you would be relatively brief because you wanted to engage in a, in a serious questions and answer session. I think we have a great advantage of having Nick with us. Uh, you all read the booklet, as I stated earlier, uh, his vast experience both in the private and public sector. I met Nick as long as I think 10 or 12 years ago in Washington, and even then he was uh, an important figure at the time working for BP and very much deep into the debate over the future of energy and energy security. So I think we're very fortunate to have him here and uh, I want to immediately open the floor uh, for questions. Julian Anne, PFC Energy. In fact, I have to say I read your piece in the Financial Times which is about this subject a few days ago. And I think you left out one thing that I wonder if you'd address is the issue of the big oil companies all going and I suppose as uh, BP, which is really involved with NLCs and, and at the forefront of dealing with NLCs, and as you see that big oil can't get access, 
to conventional mm. resources. Don't you think that in a way that's driving the shale gas revolution as well? If you see what's going on in um, Ukraine and Eastern Europe and even Germany, even France, it's big oil. Shall we take a few and then I'll... Okay. We have a I, can, I can hear. It's fine. it's fine. And please, as, as the previous person did, identify your name and your affiliation, please. Alexander Oxwell, Watch Institute. Uh, I agree with 99 point, probably 99 percent of what you said, and I have a very optimistic stance myself on the share on the on the role that shale gas can play in the future. I need to challenge you on the renewable numbers, of course, representing an environmental NGO, uh, and you talk about two percent of renewables. I don't. I, I would like to ask you where where you've got these numbers from. Uh, it must at least exclude large hydro. Uh, hydro alone uh, provides about 8% of global energy, not just electricity resources. And I also want to point to the fact that um, here as well, the, the experience that countries make is of course not the same. If you look, if you include large hydro, you have countries like Norway, Brazil, uh, where renewables already provide about 80% of electricity, not energy, primary energy, but electricity market. And you have some quite impressive success stories in many other countries as well. So. I, I just want to point to the fact that large hydro is not included in these numbers. Take one more. Maybe one more? Yeah. Why don't we do it easier, the closest here, for the micro to travel, and then you could pass it on. There's another question. But uh, my name is Istvan Kalmar from Kalamites. KFT, it is not uh, the French word, but it is the plant where coal is coming from. Uh, I have actually two issues, so I liked very much your presentation, and I enjoyed that. I have uh, just two questions. So one is, uh, uh, there is about shale gas from Cornell University. Professor Howard has written uh, also a letter to the United States president about the environmental impacts. Uh, and this, this comes to the next question also, uh, that at the moment uh, we are speaking about environment, which is a very important issue, but we don't speak about the full life cycle of the different uh, energy uh, like natural gas, so when it's, when it's coming close, it's okay. But when it's coming far from countries, then the IPCC doesn't come any, anything upstream. Only the downstream issues are calculated in the CO2 uh, audits. So that's make a difference with the coal accounts. Thank you. Okay, let me take those three. Um, first of all, on the environmental, I agree with the point. That's exactly right, the IPCC don't work like that, and uh, shale gas is clearly not carbon free. Uh, and if carbon pricing and all that goes with that becomes part of the story again, which is an open question, uh, then I think it, it will add to costs. But we're not there yet, and I don't see any immediate agreement or international agreement on carbon pricing. I, I wish there were, but I don't see the US, even under President Obama, moving in that direction. I don't see a Republican Congress moving in that direction. And I think if the Americans don't move, then the Indians and the Chinese won't move. And then nobody will move, and Europe, including particularly those countries which have taken a lead on climate change, will be left behind and will be feeling rather uncompetitive. Uh, so, you, I, but I, I agree with your point, basically. On the, the question of the companies, uh, yes, it's a fair point. The oil and, and the gas companies are, see this as an opportunity, and that is for two reasons, I think. One, they cannot get access to the Middle East, uh, which is where the main resources of oil, certainly, and probably conventional natural gas as well, are to be found. They are finding it almost impossible. They can't get into Saudi Arabia. They're not allowed to go into Iran. Iraq is still very dangerous and difficult, and the terms are not <coughs> clear uh, in Iran. Um, Kuwait is effectively closed, and Abu Dhabi is not doing much more business. So that cuts off a lot of the potential for them to invest in and to replace their current production, which is a driving motive in the the oil and gas industry. Then they have two other places to go. One is Africa, which is still regarded, um, rightly or wrongly, as corrupt. 
very difficult to work in places like Nigeria. Some countries are much better. I think there are very good stories. Places like Ghana are good prospects, but they're, they're not huge. They don't, I mean, if you're an oil company like Shell produce now three and a half million barrels a day, that's a lot of resources to replace every year. Uh, and then the other one is Russia. Uh, people, some people have got in and have done quite well. Other people have tried to get in for many years. Most people in the oil and gas industry wouldn't trust Russia as a place to invest. So if you want to keep your business going, you move to things like shale. The other reason I think that the oil companies are, are thinking about it, or if not doing it yet, is that uh, they've looked at renewables and have found, sadly, uh, renewables to be uncommercial. They do not like investing in businesses that are reliant on continuing public subsidies at a time when public expenditure is being constrained. So let me come back to the point on renewables then. Uh, the figures of IEA figures, they do exclude hydro, but they are all the other renewables, wind, uh, solar, everything else. Um, it is, it's actually less than 2% now. 7% by 2035 on their most optimistic scenario. Uh, I hope they're wrong, but I don't think they're that wrong. In fact, I think, as they would say, it's more likely to be less than 7%, uh, unless somebody makes a great technical breakthrough, particularly on energy storage. If you could do that, that would change the game. But nobody's done it yet. Thank you, then you are Bishkega of these two aspects of Brussels, the butler. Thank you very much for your presentation. And since you are economist, I would like to ask you a question about the um, economic side of the shale gas projects. Um, what are the rate of return on the shale gas projects? Does it vary from one country to another, I mean, say, or from one, one geological formation to another in the United States? I was an information, for instance, where, when people discussed about recent move of Total into a new attack, what's warm I mean, let's say it's uh, quite expensive I mean let's say but possibly like right since the competition is like much less than on the US market I mean let's say it provides like, some of the conventional gas uh, exploration provides more higher rate of return than shale gas if you can comment on this thank you <coughs> uh, what's the question are you in the back are you still <coughs> Charlie Ebinger from Brookings. Uh, it's nice to see you. Yeah. Right. Um, one energy source I, I think you left out in your equation, uh, and that is unconventional oil. Uh, with the developments of shale gas in the United States, we are finding that much the same technology is allowing the development of oil shale, shale oil, excuse me, uh, that is um, quite significant. We now believe that the Eagleford field down on the Texas-Mexico border could, within a year or two, be close to a million barrel a day field. The Bakken field in North Dakota and Montana, probably 750,000, 800,000 barrels a day. The idea that the U.S. is going to continue to decline as an oil producer, I think, is very outmoded if one looks at what is the reality of what is happening. I'll grant there are major environmental problems, and when we move into California <coughs> and Utah, those will surface even more. But I think this is a trend, just as shale gas was missed for a long time when it first started being produced as to its significance, I think uh, you're going to see the same thing on the oil side. Just one additional point, <coughs> this is kind of a bugbear of mine, because there is a solution to the nuclear long-term waste issue, and that, it doesn't work if you want to be like the Japanese and the French and reprocess and save it for the future. But if you're truly interested in long-term nuclear waste storage, we have a facility in southern New Mexico, that, the WIP facility, that right now, sadly, is relegated to only taking military waste. But that facility, which is a salt cavern, is capable from people I have talked to there who are the technical experts, of which I am not of taking all the existing nuclear waste in the world and covering it for a significant period of time. It has been stable geologically for literally millions of years. 
most people say it is a unique repository unlike any other in the world. And I just think if we could overcome some of the politics, at least for the civilian nuclear waste side, even if we limit it to the United States, there is a solution. And it may solve the U.S. fiscal <laughs> problem as well at the same time. There's a question down here. Thank you, sir. I'm Andrei Knapleni. I came from Russia. I am consultant to the board of Gazprom Bank and professor of Russian State Olympia University and your tomorrow's speaker. And despite the fact that there were two strong statements about my country, I will not ask any question about these statements <laughs> or about the country. Uh, I will ask you a more general question, which I think may be echoed to some extent the previous question. Don't you think that maybe the story of the shale gas in the global perspective has been repeating the stories of a lot of previous energy sources, sometimes unconventional, that later on became conventional energy sources, with the initial period of overestimation of their role in the energy balance, in the economic development, and then, at some uh, time period, more accurate evaluations based on more accurate economic, political assessments, bring overestimation to some sort of saturation curve. And then we're coming, let me say, to the period when it's not that perceptions, not optimistic perceptions, sometimes over-optimistic perceptions of the revolutionary role of these energy sources that need to solve a lot of problems in this or that energy economy are uh, substituted by more accurate, normal uh, the, the evaluation of their competitive niche. So my question to you, do you think that today we have already come with the shale gas to this saturation uh, stage of the curve of the evolution of the future role in the, uh, our developing emerging energy economy? Whether now we're trying to already define the normal competitive niche uh, based not so much on the perceptions, including sometimes political perceptions, based sometimes I don't know, factual developments, in, including in my country, or perceptions about its behavior. So where this first initial overestimated phase of treating shale gas, as for instance, earlier we're treating biomass, or earlier nuclear, or earlier, for instance, some other energy sources, or renewables, has been now pumped down a little bit. And we are entering the phase of normal, non-politicized discussions of what will be competitive niche of the shale gas as just another ingredient in the fuel mix in the global energy economy. So can you comment on this, if you please? With, with pleasure, yes. Yeah. Somewhere in the, um, in the BP files is a note which I wrote about 10 years ago um, looking at the what could change the game one of my jobs was to look at what could change the game in the international energy market, uh, either politics or economics or technology. And one of the th so the people I worked with put up all sorts of ideas, and one of them was shale gas. And we came to the conclusion that it was um, just a bubble. It was much overrated in the U.S and it wasn't going to produce more than a minor percentage of US supply ever because of the cost, uh, the likely cost of getting, <coughs> of getting any of it actually produced. Uh, I won't tell you what all the other conclusions of the paper were. They're probably just about as wrong, but <laughs> what you've seen in the US over 10 years is a 12-fold increase in shale gas from nothing when it was written off uh, as being unproducible really, to now over 20% of gas supply rising on safe, pretty safe prediction from known fields and known economics towards 35 or 40% over the next 10 or 15 years. Uh, so where are we on the global curve? I think it, of course it's not going to change everything, but I think in particular countries, as in the US, it is going to change quite a lot. In the US, it stopped the country being an importer of gas. And the US is now at least talking about exports. It's self-sufficient. We, we spent ages trying to build new import facilities for LNG in the US. Totally unnecessary now. We spent years trying to develop Alaskan gas. 
uh, totally uneconomic now because the shale gas is there. Now, I'm not saying shale gas will take over everything and wipe out or, God forbid, wipe out gas from its business. Um, but what I think it will do, what I think it will do, will have a, a very specific effect in particular countries where there's a combination of circumstances, where the volumes are there and they can be produced economically, and where the market is there and where there's an energy security concern, as I've tried to explain. I think the country that is most interesting in this is China. The, the numbers as produced over the last few weeks have suggested very large volumes in China. The market is clearly there. I think that that would have knock-on effects on a number of other things in the international energy business. If it happens, it may not happen, but I think it's quite possible. So that's where I am on the curve. We'll see in, we'll come back in five or 10 years and see where we end up. On the, um, the question number, uh, uh, on the four, um, oh yes, on uh, unconventional oil, I'm sorry. Um, I, I didn't talk about that because I was talking about shale gas as a competitor to supply the power generation sector against other potential sources going, so nuclear, conventional gas, <coughs> and coal, and so on. I see unconventional oil, which is very interesting and which I don't know enough about, as competing with conventional oil and biofuels to produce liquids. So essentially gasoline and other liquids. And uh, that looks very interesting too. Again, there are said to be big environmental issues, but it, uh, it certainly looks to be a, a change, if not a huge change. So uh, I only left it out because the market I was focusing on was the, the one where gas is competing principle. Yeah, I think we have a question down here. Melanie Kinderdine with MIT, and you actually missed the gentleman's question on the nuclear waste disposal, oh. and which is good because I was going to actually offer some clarification. That is the waste isolation pilot plant in southern New Mexico. I was, until he said WIP, I thought he was going to say Yucca Mountain in Nevada. Um, and I just said a couple of points of clarification. And, and I'm from New Mexico. Uh, I used to be known at the Department of Energy as the WIP lady. Um, it was, I, well, I was actually the anti-WIP lady. That is not for, it's not only just for military waste, it's for transuranic waste. So it's medical waste from experimental facilities, et cetera, but it's very low level uh, nuclear waste. It hasn't been uh, designed for very hot, high level waste. I dare say that would take an enormous amount of work to, to actually determine that it was uh, success, uh, <coughs> capable of taking the very hot, high level waste from commercial nuclear plants and I would say we actually have a facility, it's in Nevada. Um, and so I would just be, uh, caution the gentleman about his, his uh, uh, embrace of WIP for a lot of high level commercial waste. I think I won't get in the middle of Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. Right, because I am the anti-WIP lady. So. Somebody right behind you, actually two people behind you My name is Gabor Serge from Concord Asset Management based here in Budapest. Uh, when you mentioned uh, the usage of gas in the electricity production, uh, you mentioned four competitors. But if, if we would talk about transportation, we can only mention one main competitor, which is the oil. Which, uh, which is the oil. Right. I would be very curious about the tendencies you are um, <coughs> seeing uh, which are affecting the infrastructure change in transportation and shaping a higher demand for the natural gas coming from shale formulations. 
My name is Thomas Geisel of E.ON Rogas. Um, I very much like your presentation, maybe except for the very end when you said countries need to decide do they put more emphasis on security of supply than they should develop shale gas or are they more concerned with the environment than they're unlikely to do it. I would think that probably gas is, well, whether it's conventional or unconventional, should play a major role in the, say, next 20, 25 years because it's the cleanest fossil fuel. If shale gas would not overcome the env environmental concerns, I would think it probably competes with coal, and if they cannot prove that they're better, or that they're envi environmentally better than coal, I think we may quite as well use coal because, uh, I mean, in terms of security of supply, coal is as, as good as, as shale gas, and it's probably even less expensive to produce. So I think that the main challenge for shale gas will be to overcome the environmental concerns, uh, particularly, I guess, when it comes to its production, of course. Can we move the mic over here? Thank you. Hello, uh, Alex Schiff is my name. I work here at CEU, and um, I also work in something called Global Energy Assessment, which is a very large um, effort to um, develop scenarios of energy development for 50 to 100 years, and I'm working on energy security in this effort. So I, I, I was really impressed. It's a very, very good presentation, and a couple of thoughts that I would like to emphasize. One is that I think um, we have this impression that the future energy systems will be dominated by one source, but we should develop this that there will be a lot of small sources. When you say it's just 7% renewables, yes, but if you but it's only 11% nuclear in the most optimistic scenario. And if you include biomass and renewables, it gets to about 30%, and it's more than gas. So that in this optimistic IE scenario, you have biomass plus renewables provide more energy than gas. And, and, and that's, that's not to say something against gas, it's just to say that the future will consist of these small you know, uh, energy sectors, not big revolutions. And the second thought, which I really like from your presentation, is that it all depends upon the country. And in particular, for example, nuclear. I mean, there is no global nuclear solution. Even the most optimistic nuclear energy association projection is 18% of energy in the future. But for some countries, it may be a solution. And in the same way as you emphasized gas, probably there is no global revolution, but for some countries, it may be a solution. Thank you. Same with renewables. Yeah, okay, we have one over here, right with the mic. Good afternoon, Chabo Morushai from University of North Carolina. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And I have a question and maybe a remark uh, uh, to your words. Uh, first of all, um, I thank you very much for the, for the uh, presentation on the share gas option, but I'd like to remark on the option of like, overestimation of the share gas option in the future. And uh, well, connected to this issue, I'd like to slightly dis uh, disagree uh, with your uh, point on China and Russia. So although the Chinese may have uh, some resources on, on the shale gas, but uh, the Chinese, according to the Chinese government's plans, the Chinese energy mix would raise its uh, natural gas consumption only to 10% by 2030. And uh, that is why the Chinese are not really, or do not seem to be really interested in uh, lowering their coal and oil uh, in, in the energy mix, in the Chinese energy mix, the consumption of coal and oil in the energy mix. And the Chinese uh, have been developing pipelines, 10,000 miles of pipelines in the last uh, few years. And uh, basically, they are still pushing forward the projects with Russia. And Russia seems to be pretty uninterested in uh, the energy trade with China. The Russian government, uh, well, introduced a plan in 2007 to forward the natural gas output, the future natural gas output of the Baikal region to the west instead of uh, sending it to the east to the Chinese or Japanese market because Russia <coughs> doesn't seem to be, um, well, too interested in uh, being dependent on the Chinese market from strategic point of view. Uh, so the Chinese, for me, seem to be pretty contented uh, with their coal and, uh, and partly oil uh, dependence and the rise of Chinese natural gas consumption. 
may come from other natural gas sources, and the Chinese are interested in uh, owning natural gas from Russia, maybe instead of developing too much on shale gas production. Thank you very much. Sir, for um, Okay, let me try and answer some of them. I think the question on how much is going to happen in China is a very open question. Most of the forward plans there indicate some of the investment in power generation that is going to be made, but they, they leave a gap as to what sources are going to meet the balance. And as economic growth continues to push on at 8 9% a year, th that gets to be quite a big gap. I think as they absorb uh, what the latest analysis on how much shale gas there is, they've never thought they had indigenous supplies of natural gas. They've tried looking at various stages in the past and never found any. If, if those are confirmed, which they look to be pretty confirmed, I think that will become part of the story going forward. The issue with um, East Siberian gas is a long saga. The net result of that, as you rightly say, is that the supplies are not flowing from Russia to China, and there are no immediate plans that they're going to do so. I think that is more politics than economics. I think both countries, in a way, don't want to, don't seem to want to build that relationship, but other people can, can comment on that. I think shale gas is going to be quite important in, in the Chinese equation going forward. I agree with the colleague over there who said it is going to stay a mix. Uh, it isn't shale, it's not going to push everybody else out of the market. It's not that big. It's going to be a contributor, an interesting and challenging contributor in some markets for particular reasons. But overall, uh, and this is still very clear and it's not appreciated enough, I think, by <coughs> 2030, 2040, 2050, 75, 80% of world energy supply is still going to come from coal, oil, and natural gas. And that is, uh, I think, an unmovable fact. And renewables are great, but we've still got to get the breakthrough for them to become a really material part of the system. And uh, then somebody asked um, about transportation. I think uh, it is possible, to, of course, to use gas for vehicles. Um, the economics have never been quite right. It's, it, maybe if there's breakthroughs in that area too, you will see more gas-powered buses. At the moment, they seem more of a lifestyle choice than an economic choice. Uh, what is unnerving I saw the other day the figures for the increase in vehicles worldwide, which I think is an extra 600 million vehicles on the <coughs> world's roads, mostly in Asia, 80% plus in Asia, uh, by 2020. And most of those at the moment, unless there's some breakthrough, are going to be uh, fueled by petroleum. That's, that's what keeps world oil demand up. Question down here. Um, John Roberts with Platts. Just an observation in the question. Um, the observation is you said that there hadn't been any cutoffs as a result of the Arab Spring. Uh, well, there were, was, of course, the um, bombing of the Jordanian uh, <coughs> and the letting it as well. But also, there was a Libyan gas cutoff. And the ABCM totally is not to be ignored as a result of unrest. Um, the other thing is, timing seems to be very important. Um, how much do you think that um, as perceptions of shale gas change, particularly in a country like Poland, as the reserves get confirmed, which one would expect to happen in the next year or two, does that change the scene <coughs> well in advance of actual development? And particularly, since, since that would happen before, as it were, any significant volumes of gas that might arrive, arrive in Europe via the Southern Corridor? Uh, let me just answer that because yeah. it's a very interesting question. I think the answer, uh, on the first point, yes, of course, the Libyan supplies were cut off, but they were replaced pretty quickly. And uh, 
the Sinai pipeline into Jordan and Israel has been much more disruptive than anything that happened as a result of the civil war in Libya. Uh, on the second question, I think what happens in Poland is very interesting. Uh, I think it's interesting on many dimensions of, for instance, the dimension of public policy. Should there be a European-wide standard uh, in respect of shale gas development? I think some environmental groups would certainly say that there should be. Uh, I don't think the Poles, the Poles would be very happy with that. I think if the reserves are confirmed, uh, they are likely to be developed. If it can be done commercially. And I think that, yes, that does begin to make people question whether you need the number of pipelines that are being talked about, the number of LNG facilities that are being talked about. It, it preempts a slice of the market going forward. And um, it's going to be very interesting to see that, as you say, timing is crucial. Um, but now that it's there, I think there's perhaps one extra question mark over each of those big and very expensive long-term, long-distance gas projects. Yes, thanks. Kevin Massey with Brookings. Right here. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I was interested to see you list uh, LNG as a potential competitor to shale gas. Uh, in your subsequent uh, remarks and uh, answer to questions, you, you, you mentioned the potential of the US to export LNG um, on the back of its shale gas boom. Um, just taking the title of this uh, seminar uh, as the framing for my question, what, what do you think, firstly, uh, uh, is the feasibility of U.S. exports of LNG? And secondly, what would the implications be for international gas markets and European energy security if the U.S. became a major LNG exporter? Another good question. I think technically very feasible and certainly be done. No, uh, there seems to be enough gas in the US and if the US for its own energy security reasons doesn't want to retain the gas then exports are perfectly possible across the Atlantic. Uh, what would that do? That would add to the volume of supplies going into Europe which are coming from all sides now. The supplies are coming from Trinidad which, which were originally intended to go into the US they're now coming into southern Europe. Uh, what it, it just reshapes the competitive stack and it comes down to cost, which are the most cost effective ways of getting <coughs> your gas. Uh, uh, clearly, Russian supplies are going to be relatively cheap compared to long distance LNG, but there is a political concern if people are not totally, with apologies, I mean, it's a common political <laughs> Uh, then uh, that, that might encourage people to seek a diversity of supply, even if it costs a little more. Then there's the question of what happens next in Libya. Is it, are supplies going to be, is the civil war going to continue? Or is supplies going to be restored within a reasonable period of time? Uh, that's, that's another source into Europe. What uh, the possibility you talk about just adds to the diversity potential for Europe, and that must be a good thing. There's a question all the way in the back. Hi. <coughs> Thanks very much. My name is Tom Lynch. I'm with CEU. <coughs> one of the things that interests me is that, just from, I'm not an expert like yourself, but one of the things that interests me here today is much of the thinking I hear, I would call it basically first generation thinking, nothing much new. But what I think is needed is, a, is some sort of new thinking around this whole problem. The shale gas actually provides an opportunity for some new thinking, probably bringing together developments of the oil economy with some environmental issues. Now, now what I have in mind, <coughs> people may laugh, but there is one person who's brought forward an interesting policy notion of the use of shale gas in the United States, and that's T. Boone Pickens. Now his view is that you could use the development of shale gas to solve a niche on the environmental side. He basically wants to use it to reduce dependence on foreign oil to the U.S. But what he wants to do is he wants to develop a new sort of well, niche in the economy. He wants to basically put their long distance transport, their 18 wheelers. As he says, I want the 18 wheelers. And he recognizes a large public investment required. He's met, I think, with Dennis Cho. I think he's actually had talks with Obama about this. It hasn't gotten the kind of traction that I think he would like. 
But that kind of thinking, I think, is to me quite exciting and interesting. It's sort of a uh, private sector policy initiative. People make money out of it. But are you aware of anybody else who's trying to give some thought, a different kind of thought, these kinds of problems, and get us beyond this, like, a choice between an oil economy and a clean environment? He's trying to basically, he's very practical. He recognizes we're not going to get off of oil and gas. But if we have to be on it, how can we structure our consumption to try to achieve some other social goals? I think that's the challenge. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start on that. I mean, it's interesting. I wasn't really intending to go in that direction with the talk because it's so broad. But it's, it's, it's interesting. I think the most in, some of the most intriguing possibilities are on the consumption side of energy, which I didn't talk about. Uh, there's great scope for increasing efficiency, and that needs both technical advance and the right set of regulations and public policy incentives to do it. Uh, and, I mean, there are great things to do, for instance, in reusing waste, which I think is a neglected area, uh, where people could be incentivized to, again, produce some of their own energy by recycling, perhaps on a local or regional or urban basis. We do very little of that. I mean, we, we just treat waste as a sunk cost, lost cost. So there are many intriguing ideas around <coughs> without thinking that you're going to transform the whole energy economy. But I think that would take another seminar. And you need a whole range of other different experts to look at how energy is used in particular ways, how it's used in the home. A place like this, which is a you know, modern, uh, progressive university with the absolute wor worst lighting <laughs> <laughs> in energy efficiency terms. The heat, I mean, what is it, 10 degrees too hot? Why? Why? <laughs> is the question all the way back? Thank you. My name is Martin Thomas, a junior visitor to CEU. And uh, as someone who spent the last few days in the library too much, I've not been following the um, French presidential debate, so could you comment on what exactly the environmental issues in that debate are? And also, um, could you comment on the um, convention? Because I think it's always assumed that environmental issues <coughs> of shale gas are CO2 only, but there is conventional pollution involved as well, like in Chesapeake Bay, where the sort of, uh, these are areas that are already inhabited and there are social and environmental costs to exploiting such resources. It's not all in Siberia. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I haven't been in France, so I, this is just second-hand from the newspapers. There was a very uh, full piece on it in the Herald Tribune yesterday, uh, which is that what started a small-scale protest against small-scale plans to develop shale gas in France have escalated and become a major political issue there. Uh, with people saying it will damage groundwater supplies and, and, uh, and other things. Uh, and this has now risen to Sarkozy getting involved, as well as central government, which is not where it started, but it's, it, it's where it was yesterday. Uh, I think this is an example of the uh, continuing strength of the environmental movement in European politics, uh, which is, is very interesting in the continuing distrust of big oil and gas of the corporate sector in, in Europe and the to me unresolved question between energy security and environmental concern and um, I don't know enough more about France to to say anything authoritative maybe there are people here who do Nick um when, uh, when I learned that you accepted uh, our invitation to, to open this conference, I was extremely happy because I knew, uh, again, knowing your background, there wouldn't be a better person to open this conference and to cover the broad areas uh, uh, that the questions reflected um, this afternoon. And uh, I want to ask all of you to uh, join me in thanking Nick Butler both for his presentation and the time he spent with us to answer all the questions. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch and, and moving this uh, project uh, on energy and energy environment and security forward here with you at CEU. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.